Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, I hope you are fine and doing great. In the previous lecture, I introduced that what are manufacturing systems, some related metrics to gauge the performance of a manufacturing system, and the types of such systems. This lecture will be dedicated to the second type of manufacturing system that I in the previous lecture said is called production or assembly lines. Moreover, I'll focus the discussion towards the automated production and assembly lines instead of manual one. Whether it's a production line or an assembly line, automated lines are an example of fixed automation. As explained in the initial lecture, fixed automation setups are specialized for producing one kind of product only, and therefore alteration in the product is really difficult to incorporate once the automated line starts working. Such lines are hence most suitable for mass production of products whose design is well established and is not going to change any sooner. Moreover, products whose life is anticipated to be quite long are only produced through such fixed automation lines. What happens in these automated lines is that a work unit enters the line from one side, visits every workstation sequentially where it is processed, and by the time it exits the last, all operations have been performed on it to produce the finalized product. The automated lines bring several advantages into the manufacturing of a product provided the product is suitable for being manufactured on an automated line. Advantages like reduced labor cost and hence product cost is alone enough to enthuse an industrialist towards such systems. However, other major advantages are also as important as that of the cost advantage. For example, high production rate may be achieved that will reduce the work in progress and hence manufacturing lead time. Furthermore, the efficient use of factory floor space can generate room for other manufacturing systems and additionally provides a safer working environment for machines as well as human workers. Theoretically, an automated production line may consist of as many distinct workstations as required, and all such workstations specialize in performing a unique or few number of processing operations on the work unit. Note over here that a slight difference between a production line and an assembly line. In production line, processing is done on the work part, whereas on assembly line, no processing is done, but only assembly is done. So whatever is being done on the automated line, the most important thing is that all workstations are connected through work handling system that is capable of moving work unit from one workstation to the next, as well as position it correctly for a workstation to perform the operation. This overall view of an automated production line is well depicted by the figure shown over here. The starting work material enters the production line from one side and are transferred from one station to the next station through automated means. Once processing has been performed on it, at the end the completed part or product is produced. On the outside, a production line consists of two things the machine tools that will perform the required operation on the work unit and the work handling system. Discussion of machine tools is out of scope of this course. However, how these machine tools are connected through a work handling system makes up the overall layout of the factory floor and this lies right in the middle of the scope of this course. So let's discuss that what a work handling system is and what various configurations of this system are there. As described earlier, the work handling system's main job is to transfer work unit from one workstation to the other in a sequence. If you are paying attention, then immediate question in your mind would be that as parts are transferred sequentially from one station to the other, then what if the next station is still processing a part when a new part has arrived? It is a very valid and relevant question. Well, answer to that would be in the type of mechanism used for the work transportation. Such mechanisms are sometimes synchronous while at others asynchronous. By the name it is clear that if all workstations require same amount of time for processing a part, then all parts will move synchronously from one station to the other. Hence, there won't be any delay because as soon as a part is processed by the workstation, the next part is coming its way through an automated conveyor. While processing is being done on the part, the conveyor would be stationary so that no part can move from one station to the other station. 
The fact that the conveyor remains stationary allows different machine tools to take their time for processing the part. Hence, when all machines are done processing, the conveyor will carry the work units to the next station. You can figure out easily that the time for which the conveyor will remain stationary depends on the machine tool that takes the largest time to process the part. If the processing time difference between the machine tools present on the production line is too much, then machine tools having small processing time would be largely underutilized. Therefore, synchronous mechanisms are used by the work transport systems if processing time required by individual machine tools has a small variation. On the other hand, if machine tools are quite fast and they are producing work parts on their output quite quickly, then it's better to have a storage capacity between workstations. Normally referred to as storage buffers, these intermediate locations increase the utilization of the whole system by permitting queues to be formed between the workstations. Such work transport systems are called asynchronous systems and they allow easy rearrangement or expansion of the production line. Moreover, these storage buffers may be operated manually or automatically as per the requirement. Particularly, there are several more advantages associated with storage buffers. For example, if the nth station breaks down or malfunctions, then all previous stations may still keep working as their output would be stored in a buffer. And on the other hand, all upstream stations may draw work units from the buffer storage to keep on working without any interruption. Of course, the buffer before and after the malfunction workstation should have at least as many parts such that the required processing time would be greater than the time required for repair works. Hence, the buffer storage will act as a bank of parts to supply to the production line in case parts from the preceding workstations are not coming. Moreover, as processing is being performed on the work units through machine tools, then certain processes may require curing time before the next operation may be performed. Therefore, buffers would provide this required curing time as well. Although the purpose of all different configurations of work part transportation system is same, but depending on the type of products and processing operations, certain configurations prove beneficial than others. Basically, there are three different configurations in which work part transportation systems may be installed. The first one is the simplest one, called inline configuration. This configuration is used when either the machine tool or individual workstations are quite large in size or number, or the work part to be processed is quite large in size. Moving bulky parts on the production line demands high amount of energy. That is why simple straight motion is desirable. The schematic shown over here describes the general arrangement of machine tools and work transportation system in this configuration. The second configuration is called segmented inline configuration. The name reveals what it will be like. Although it has straight segments like the inline configuration, but these segments are not continuous in effect that there are bends and turns in the overall line. A number of purposes are achieved through segmentation of the line. For example, to save space on the factory floor, you may want to turn the line maybe up to 90 degrees or sometimes instead of implementing an expensive automatic system to change the orientation of the work unit, simple turning mechanism on the conveyor can achieve the desired orientation. Moreover, sometimes the fixture need to return to the starting position so that new work parts may be installed on them for processing. Therefore, in that case, the end of the conveyor is linked with the start through an opposite moving segment. This is shown in this schematic over here. The work carrying fixtures are returned to the starting position after being washed via washing station so that they can carry new work units. The last configuration is called the rotary configuration and yes, the work transportation system rotates in a circle. As shown in this schematic, the work units are held by the fixtures around the periphery of a circular work table and the table's movement is indexed. That is, it moves in fixed angular steps. The angle of movement of course depends on the number of workstations present around the periphery. The work table is technically called a dial and the whole mechanism is called dial indexing machine. 
The obvious advantage of this mechanism is the space requirement as it occupies a very small space. Moreover, it's best suited for small sized work units only. Another thing you might be thinking about is that if the work table indexes and all work units move from one station to the next synchronously, then it means asynchronous movement and hence buffer storage are out of question in this configuration. Yes, that's true. These mechanisms are only used for synchronous motion and there are no buffer storages in between workstations. No matter which configuration or work transportation system is being used and whether it is synchronous or asynchronous and no matter how many workstations are along the length of the line, there are numerous sometimes hundreds or even thousands of operations that need to be performed simultaneously and repeatedly. Definitely, some kind of computerized controller needs to control everything with higher reliability. So, let's discuss that what control functions are required and what kind of industrial controllers are implemented to achieve this task. Generally speaking, there are three different kind of functions a controller of an automated production line has to carry out. The first one is the sequence control, that is the sequential control of the machine tools and work transportation system. The second is the safety monitoring, that is to ensure all the systems are operating within safe bounds. And lastly, the quality control, that is the operations that are being performed on the work unit are achieving the desired quality. Sequence control includes the control of every component of the work part transportation system and of workstations. As things are going about automatically, so everything must be precisely timed and actuated. For fast moving production lines, the timing and motion accuracy becomes more important. Typically, the sequence controller should identify the end of the operation by the workstation on the work unit, control the release of the part from the workstation, transport it locate it at the next workstation, position it and signal the workstation to start operation and so on. On the other hand, safety monitoring is a very crucial function for the whole setup. The controller has to make sure nothing is operating in an unsafe manner or even going near the safe limits. Over here, safety of the equipment as well as human workers present on the factory floor is concerned. Realistically, sometimes safety of the equipment is easier or you can say routine work for the system because the uncertainties involved are not that much. However, safety of human workers is quite a challenging task as they are unpredictable and free to do anything. Therefore, factory floor is organized in such a way that it minimizes the human worker interaction with dangerous machinery and on top of that, additional sensors are being used to detect any unsafe situation. Note that these sensors are not required for the sequence control function. These are dedicated to safety monitoring only. The last but definitely not the least function of the controller of an automated production line is to keep an eye on the quality of the products being manufactured on the line. Certain attributes as defined by the product design of the product must be ensured that they meet the specifications. This monitoring is performed by a controller via additional equipment and sensors that are dedicated to check the specifications of the manufactured part as it is being manufactured. Normally, there are two different ways to perform the quality checks and both ways are generally implemented simultaneously. The first way is to incorporate quality checking instruments on the workstation so that as the part is being manufactured, the instrument keeps an eye on the required specification. Whereas the other way is to design and install a dedicated inspection workstation that has no other job except to inspect the quality of the part. Concurrent quality checking is although an expensive way to maintain quality, but it saves a lot of time and machining effort by rejecting the part as soon as any problem is detected in it. Alternatively, quality may be checked only when the product has been completely manufactured. Although it will be easier and cheaper to do so, but in the process you would have wasted valuable time and machining effort if the product fails the inspection. So now we know that what functions should be performed by the controller of an automated production line. But what type of controllers can be utilized in such situations? Well, there are normally two options only. The first one is the use of programmable logic controllers, also known as PLCs, 
and secondly personal computers equipped with required software and hardware may also be used PLCs are the most used controllers because of their long history with the industry and ruggedness that they bring whereas personal computers are being used more and more nowadays in industries but not on the factory floor but at supervisory level because of the familiar user interface they offer however specially designed personal computers are also being used on factory floor but still they cannot match the dedicated power of a PLC all in all both kind of controllers are being utilized in situations where they have strengths hence both are normally used in conjunction to benefit from the strength of both kind of controllers a whole portion of this course is dedicated for the discussion on PLCs therefore i won't say any more over here whereas personal computers need not to be discussed as they have nothing new for engineers and workers these days so the learners i have discussed major components of an automated line especially production line in detail and now i hope that you have a clear picture in your mind that what a production line is and what it looks like in the next video i'll talk about the assembly lines which have all the components of a production line but with few exceptions therefore i'll talk about the differences only this is everything for this video take care and goodbye